past the Boris Labour in British uh, Parliament. Parliament grants £20 million to the state Act. £20 million is not intended to be the entire value of the enslaved people. As far as anybody could get could work it out, the value of the enslaved people at that time was held to be about £50 million. That's the men and women and children. It's not the land with which they were associated. It's, it's the people as property, as a capital good. And Parliament, amongst other things in the Abolition Act, said not all enslaved people are equal. In the sense that the value of enslaved people differed between Parliament. And in British Guiana, for example, which maybe you all know was a uh, frontier sugar colony in the early 19th century, enslaved people were extremely valuable. In Jamaica, by contrast, which was a mature or declining sugar economy, enslaved people were less valuable at the end of slavery. And so the 20 million pounds is divided not on the basis of every soul who's being um, taken out of captivity out of slavery, but on the basis of the economic value that is attributable to the enslaved populations of each of those jurisdictions. And the state worked this out by going back into the 1820s, looking at all the records they could find for the buying and selling of human beings in those colonies and working out the average value. And then the £20 million was divided up amongst the colonies, amongst the slave owners of those colonies, based on the number of enslaved people in those colonies, multiplied by their average value, gives you the total, and then they divided it in the same proportions. So British Guiana, for example, has about one in eight of the enslaved people in the Caribbean, but gets about a quarter of the uh, compensation. Slave owners of British Guiana then get these big lumps of compensation um, for uh, the enslaved people whose freedom they um, are, are giving up. The piece of paper that I gave you, as you'll see from the bottom, is from Antigua. It's chosen not, not entirely at random, of course, um, but it is one of about 350 pages that were published, printed by Parliament in 1837-1838. An MP at that point said in Parliament, I want to know who got slave compensation. And that triggered, it's called a parliamentary return, an obligation on the state to account to the MPs. Um, the man who asked for it was a man called Daniel O'Connell, who was an, a Catholic MP uh, from Ireland uh, and an anti-slavery activist from some years. It's never been clear to me, we've never found um, explicit discussion of what his motivation was in doing this, but I think it's reasonable to conclude that he believed this information was important and should be public. Who were the slave owners? And as Catherine has said, we've taken the same view that this information is important and should be public, um, and we wanted to make it public, and hence the database, um, a commitment that whatever work we did, we would then put into people's hands because it's too important to have confined um, amongst a few historians. We've had it for a while, we've done work on it, but this information should, uh, should be free in every sense. And you can see from this list, as I say, it's more or less at random. This is the top level of information that was provided um, in response to the, uh, the, re the request for an accounting of the amounts of money. You can see the date on which the award was made. You can see they tend to be made in a very narrow period of time, 1835. What's happening is mass processing the claims in London. They're just going, yes, 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 yes until they come to something called a litigated claim, you can see them on the list, and this is where two or more people say, those people, those enslaved people belong to me, or I have a claim on those enslaved people. And in those circumstances, there had to be an arbitration done by the commissioners who were established to sort out what should happen with the money. So there is further records that deal with those litigated claims. You can see that it includes a unique claim number, and that's important in tracking through the records. Then the name of the party to whom the payment is awarded, the number of slaves, okay, that's the only place in which the enslaved turn up in this document as numbers, and then the amount of money that was awarded. And that's the, the top level of the information. This is where we started by computerizing, digitizing these records. But as you can see, it is only a start, it doesn't tell you important things. I'll come back to those in a moment. 
what it does give you some sense of, of course, is the spread of slave ownership. In other words, you can see on this list men and women who own very small numbers of enslaved people. I'm looking, for example, at number 273. Anne Harmon, uh, a woman by definition, owns one enslaved person and is paid 19 shillings, 16, 19 pounds, 16 shillings, and threepence in exchange for the freedom of that enslaved person. Or you can look at Sir C.B. Covington Bart in the top right hand corner. You can see he's got a number of claims, 329, 332, 334. Hundreds, hundreds of people belong to the quotation marks to the covering of family. And they owned large estates. They also had a lease on Barbuda, and which they used effectively as a pen for enslaved <coughs> people. They effectively raised enslaved people to sell them from uh, Barbuda um, for uh, many, many decades. And this is the end of the story, and Covington is being paid significant amounts of compensation. So there's a variety, there's a spectrum here from people often resident in the colonies who own small numbers of enslaved people because it's embedded in the society. In urban areas, women will have domestic servants or they will have people who they're using as artisans whom they're hiring out and receiving um, uh, back the hire of those people who have skills as, as coopers or wheelwrights um, or um, as craftsmen in an urban environment in the Caribbean. So these lists don't differentiate between those who lived in the Caribbean and were slave owners and those who lived in Britain and were slave owners. You need to do, go on and do the work in order to do that, uh, which is one of the things that uh, we have attempted to do. And in the case of Sir Christopher Covington, for example, he and his family were resident in Britain for many uh, years. They moved originally uh, to the Caribbean in the early days, established a fortune, a dynasty, brought the money and the status back to Britain, <coughs> built country houses and became gentrified as part of the, the Gloucestershire gentry. Similarly, the next name down the list, in the top right hand corner, Robert C. Tudway, for example, uh, 330. The Tudways, and, and Keith may say more about this, uh, are a gentry family for um, more than two centuries in Wells, uh, in Somerset, Cathedral City, um, or effectively a cathedral, I should say. Um, but they were the MPs there for, for generations, just one generation after another um, have access to power. Merchants are an important part of this picture too. Of course, the enslaved people were the basis, the foundation of a trading economy based not only on the people themselves until 1807, as Catherine said, but on the produce from the estates. Not only sugar, um, but coffee. Cotton, critically important um, to the early, the very early stages of the British Industrial Revolution is cotton from the Caribbean. Again, you associate, I think everybody associates um, correctly, <coughs> cotton were the southern states of the US, but in the early days in which the cotton industry was getting going in Britain, the bulk of the cotton was coming into the country being grown in the British colonies, in the Caribbean, in Britain's slave colonies. This list also, not to tell things, it doesn't tell you, doesn't tell you if you like why these particular people got the money. And that's an important caveat to make, or an important writer to make. Because the lists include people who were slave owners, owned the enslaved people in the most literal and direct sense uh, of chattel slavery that Catherine described. Many, many slave owners on the list. But there are also mortgagees, in other words, people, particularly in Britain, but not exclusively in Britain, who have lent money to the slave owners and they've secured that money on the bodies of the enslaved people. So that when compensation comes around, if you have a mortgage that's secured on enslaved people, it's you who's entitled to the compensation, not simply the owner. If you've inherited a legacy, for example, an annuity, typically men provided for women, or elite white men provided for elite white women in Britain, by um, giving annuities. In other words, a fixed amount of money each year, 50 pounds a year, for example, would buy you a bearable standard of living as a um, distressed gentlewoman. And so slave owners would secure that payment. They would make a commitment in their wills that they would support daughters, widows for their lives with these annuities. 
And those annuities were secured on their estates and on the people who worked on the estates. And so you can see that there's a financial structure that begins to spread the impact of slavery in Britain beyond slave owners into the society more, more generally. So the slavery begins to permeate not the whole society, okay, but a section of the elite who have been associated, or their families have been associated with the Caribbean over many previous years. And finally, the records, these records, are pretty much signed on the enslaved people themselves, as you can see. As I said at the outset, the enslaved people are here present only as numbers. But the records themselves are not as silent. And it's an important acknowledgement on our side that in doing the work that we've done so far, we have focused on the slave owners. That's been our priority to identify and retrieve the stories of the enslaved of the enslavers rather than the enslaved people. And that is driven partly by the nature of the archive, but only partly. And in the second phase of this work that we're doing, we want to, we will, we are actively, um, going back in time from the 1830s, the moment of the end of slavery, to look at the history of the estate developing over the previous 60 or 70 years, to see how the ownership changes. But as we trace that, we're committed to capturing and incorporating to the extent we can the records that are extant on the lives of the enslaved people. And again, those histories in many cases are as, as truly lost as you could ever be in history. For a white elite member in Britain in the 1830s, today you will find, almost certainly, you will find something about them. There are very few slave owners in Britain in the 1830s about whom we simply can find nothing. There were members of the elite, they left some trace somewhere but, of course, that's not true of, of many, the bulk of the enslaved people. But, in order, for example, to press a claim here, a slave owner had to demonstrate the legitimacy, the authenticity of the claim, and therefore had to tie the claim for money to specific um, records of slave registration. Again, as many of you know, from 1817 or thereabouts onwards, earlier for Trinidad, but from 1817 for um, almost all the colonies in the Caribbean, slave registers are being put together that are intended to record all of the enslaved people, not, of course, by, in many respects, their own names, but by the names which have been attached to them in the condition of slavery, uh, and to include some detail about those enslaved people. I say some detail. Age, Probably background in terms of are they African or are they Creole, in other words, are they born in the Caribbean or, or moved from Africa during their own lives. Um, and then sometimes age, sometimes something about condition, you know, are they well or are they sick, something perhaps about their skill level. So there is information, and um, uh, we can talk further about that um, if we choose to, but there is information on the enslaved, not only as groups, but to a degree as individuals. And that information, it seems to us, again, needs to be brought to bear because, in the end, you can't have a history of slave ownership that doesn't embrace the history of the enslaved people. It is a very partial view. So we started with the slave owners, we're going to continue with the slave owners, and we're going to try to integrate, as, we, as much as we can, histories of the enslaved people from the records that, that exist. Um, and we should be candid that there are limitations to the amount of uh, that material that we are likely to be able to incorporate, but the existing database, which I recognize as these shows here, is about slave owners. The next iteration, which we'll work on, um, but I hope will be released in about three years' time, will be an attempt to round out the picture um, by including the enslaved people. As Catherine said, what we've done is to take this universe of people, focus on those who lived in Britain, and then develop um, for them some sense about how they came by the <coughs> ownership of the enslaved people, what was their position in British society, and what they did uh, with the money. It's that material that we wanted to show you now, so that you get some sense for how all this recorded, what you can do with it, and indeed what you can't do. As I said, we understand the limitations to this data. This is not a complete picture. It doesn't purport to be a complete picture of the role of slavery in Britain. It's incomplete from a number of points of view, not least 
because it's about the end of the, of the story. All this data draws, is drawn from the 1830s when slavery is abolished, and so it reflects those who held enslaved people at the end of slavery. We have a complete census of those people, which is the fantastic thing about the records is that, bang, it's there, everybody's there, they're on these lists, and they're on these lists because they want to be there. They have a monetary claim against the British state, and they're going to, they're going to secure it. So there's a feeding frenzy around this money, and people writing in from all around the country to say, my grandfather had enslaved people years ago, I think the name of the estate is this, can you help me? So there's that, that is what's going on around the conversation, and the commission has sorted out, and in the end they decide on one or more groups of people to receive the money, award the money, and then um, establish this meticulous archive of Q that captures all this information. Okay, that was what I wanted to say as, uh, as a prelude, and now as I say, keep going and walk, walk through um, how the database is structured. Obviously, we'll come back for uh, questions and comments from you uh, in the uh, next hour. So. www.ucl.ac.uk forward slash LBS. Um, do you have, is there Wi-Fi access? Is there Wi-Fi? O W A C O N F zero two. Okay, I'll repeat that. It's O W A C O N F zero two. Uppercase or lowercase? It's lowercase for the password and for the username uppercase. That's for when you get yeah, when once you get access, yes, that is the website, isn't it? Once you're connected the the address of this site is up here. In the corner. www UCL ac uk forward slash l b s can you repeat that username please can you repeat the username please repeat the username yeah it's fine b34 m a l e t that's mallet o two or zero two Okay, I'll do that during the break. It's just I didn't want to distract this. <coughs> we'll put it up in the break. Right, what I'm going to do is to talk to you about how to use the database and ways of using it. Um, well, at the core of this database that you've built are 47,000 people. That is to say, the people who made claims for competence. Let me just finish with one other thing. Information that you have about the person, where you think you've got it wrong, but if you've got detailed information, send us the details, send us the sources that you're using. <coughs> Click a button, you have to fill in various details about your name and address and so on. You, you send it off to us, we will assess the information, supposing that everything is fine, we'll put it in the database. This is very important because this is a collective public site. It's been ours in the last three years in development. It is now yours as much as it is ours. We want you to tell us where we've got details wrong. We want to make this a, a collective public effort to build up knowledge of slave ownership and its consequences for Britain. Because we all recognize that this, as Catherine was saying, as Nick was saying, this is something which is crucial to an understanding of what Britain is now. So this is a resource for you to use as much as it is for us to populate. Thank you very much. If you go down to claim details, 
Here you can search it. Um, well, I do the states, but if you're interested in Jamaica, which was, after all, as you'll know, the largest single uh, slave owning colony, uh, in the case of Jamaica, we haven't got this yet for other colonies. We also have the parish. So if you're interested in who were the slave owners in Kingston, Jamaica, uh, we've got records of almost 2,700 people uh, making almost 2,000 claims. But if you're interested in a particular estate, for example, Hope, and you get all sorts of others as well. But for example, if you were interested in this one in, J in Manchester, Jamaica, the Hopeton Estate, uh, claim number 113, 94 enslaved, almost 2,000 pounds in compensation, uh, then you, you can see the details, who's associated, and obviously, as you'll know, because the enslaved were often given the same name, as the owner, if you're interested in tracking the enslaved through, for example, Ancestry.co.uk slave registers, you can often pick up a connection by the name of the owner. It's not infallible by any means, but it's one way of doing it. Nick, do you want to say more about that? Or no, we can come back to the estates. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that, again, this is oriented by the slave owner, as you recognize. But embedded in that, of course, therefore, is the ability to look at what do they own in terms of the land, the place, and from there, as Keith said, um, that can take you into other records not embedded currently in the memory. Um, you know, I thought perhaps the other thing to do would be just look at one of the London streets. Yes. Around here, for example. Uh, well, I'll do two things. One is, is to, uh, if you're interested in Gower Street, for example, the wider Bloomsbury area. This quick address search will enable you to search across, uh, as it says here, street, town, county, region, or country. So you put in Gower, and you'll find that there were 11 people living in Gower Street, which is just the other side of University College London. Um, or similarly, if you're interested in a particular region, Nick mentioned the Tudway family uh, in, in uh, South West England. <coughs> These are people, 217 individuals, where we know we have sufficient address information about. And these are people living in places like Bath, Cheltenham, Bristol. I mean, clearly, a substantial number given the importance of Bristol in the whole history of slave trade and slavery. Um, uh, and also simply living in the, we know, in the counties of Gloucestershire or Somerset or one of the southwest counties. So there are ways, particularly if you start narrowing down the search boxes, where you can uh, track people. Yes? What does owner in fee mean? Uh, it means effectively freeholder. It's equivalent to you owning your house. It's the purest form, if I can use that phrase in this context, it's the purest, simplest form of legal ownership you can get. There is, apparently, I didn't know this, but in ownership of anything in Britain, there is some kind of opt-out for the Crown. And that's why it isn't simply described as ownership. This ownership in fee is effectively the Crown and delivered the right to own property, absolutely, to a particular individual. So it, it stands for, for ownership in the, the simple sense. Just before I, just, can you just hang on? Because one of the things that's well worth you having a look at are the search guidance notes. And particularly for some of these technical terms, like owner and fee, what we've provided here, this is under the page search guidance, what we've provided here is a definition of these terms. So this should help you. <coughs> some of them are archaic. <coughs> Frankly, until I started work on this project, I had never heard of a tenant in tail or re remain a man, um, or indeed remain a woman. Um, but this should help you 
making sense of what there is for you there. Sorry, you wanted to... <coughs> Just on the front screen, how did Sorry, you can you speak out? Sorry. On the front screen, I know you've been saying East India is going to be a separate project, but how do you yeah. search for companies? The East India Company? Or other companies, under general companies, in that, in the first screen. Sorry, this, you mean under commercial legacy? Okay, so, so it would be under this one. Under commercial okay. firm. Thank you. Yeah. These are firms where we know that somebody just to take a top example. William Barron was a partner in this company. Uh, and Nick, who is the specialist in the commercial side, um, has tracked a lot of these people and a lot of these firms. So that, for example, this company we know was at this address in Upper Charles Street in 1830. Um, so it's possible to track a lot of firms in this database to see who's associated with them and, and how the firm evolves over a greater or lesser period subsequently. One thing I didn't uh, emphasize was that because of uh, a peculiar feature of English law at the time, the slave compensation had to be made in the name of an individual. And so the firms are not hidden, because that wasn't the intention, but the firms lie behind the name of their partners in most cases. So there are a handful of cases where by mistake they've actually got the name of the firm into the claim um, that's been awarded, but it's a handful. In almost every case you've got only an individual into the list of names that you saw, and then you have to work out, which is possible to do, in what capacity they're getting the money. So the firms are hidden, and banks in particular are not there in their, in their names, but in the names of the partnerships. Those often have some bearing, of course, on, on uh, the name of the firm, but not always. And so, as I say, you have to go through that extra step. And as far as we can, in this commercial firms, we've burned up to associate individuals with firms with the name of the... Um, and, of course, these are the names of the firms at the time. And if you're looking at the today's banks, if today's banks didn't exist then. What existed were hundreds of predecessor firms. So the Royal Bank of Scotland, for example, many, many of its banks... Uh, came into it through a merger with NatWest about 10, 15 years ago. NatWest built this business on consolidating provincial banks, and many of those banks would have had relationships with slave owners that would have led them to lend money against the estates, against the enslaved people. And when compensation comes around, these banks pop up. Um, but again, it won't be there under the name of the Royal Bank of Scotland, it's going to be there under, under the different banks. You know, one way of, if you're interested, that sort of thing, for example, if you just put in bank, then you get Bank of British North America, Bank of England, Bank of London, <coughs> bank of etc. etc. So, you know, there's a lot that you can play with in this, and um, uh, but what we've tried to do, and we you know, you have to send us your comments about it, but what we've tried to do is to make searching this as easy as possible and to give you as much help as possible in terms of the search forms as well as the search guidance notes. If there are things which a lot of people tell us, how on earth do you find search and such, then we will modify it accordingly. On the specific question of the firms, if you select a firm, I can see that you have an associated name. Are those then associated with the claims as well? So you're going to track and pick the follow one. Yes, if we take James Hughes Anderson, for example, and he's connected with the Bank of London, if you click on that, you get his biography, and you scroll down, and he's associated with these claims in Nevis. And then you're going to find out in what way he's associated with these claims. And then you click on the claim name, and this will give you any notes we've got on the nature of the claim, uh, as well as you know, up at the top. Oh, I should have said, that this date up here is the date of the award, because they weren't all awarded at the same time, but over a number of years, in the 18th century. Um, but you can also see, and there's one other thing which I didn't show you, which is important, you can see other people who are uh, connected, uh, in that case, to that firm. One of the things that you can also do with this database, and we're building it up gradually, 
is to uh, uh, look at relationships between people. Mm. Um, if, for example, let me give you uh, an example from somebody who's fairly obscure. Um, there's a woman called Charles Allen. who's in Barbados, uh, makes a claim on the Maxis state. In this case, in many cases, if you look down this side, you'll see not only address information, but in this case she's living in Livingston in Hampshire, but relationships, and click on that, and you'll find that also in the database as having a relationship to slave ownership, are her mother, one, two, three sisters, her brother Henry, her brother the Reverend Robert Allen, uh, and her father Robert Allen. And one of the things that's really extremely uh, interesting and important about taking this whole universe that we're looking at is the importance of family and kid network. The numbers of people who are engaged, not simply as individuals, they're engaged as members of families. In this case, all having a stake in one way or another uh, uh, in slave ownership. Uh, but the relations of people, for example, uh, there's a man I've been particularly interested in who's Philip John Miles, who's MP in Bristol, and his son, although not a direct slave owner and beneficiary of compensation, is also an MP and indeed a leading figure defending the West India interest in Parliament of the 1840s. Uh, uh, defending planter interests. Those kinds of networks of familial relationship in one way or another are one of the things that you can track through uh, this database. Do you feel that you disturbed the hornet's nest? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but sorry, you were... Yes, so, well, I'll come back to something related to that question. <coughs> on the specific question of the role of women. I might just be confused, but I'm I'm curious about how it is that women were able to make claims, given that it wasn't until 1882 that women were able to own property and yeah. that in their own names. So and that's a very good question. What happens as far as Britain is concerned is that, as you say correctly, property is gendered, heavily gendered in the 19th century. Um, so a married woman, for example will appear only indirectly in the records because her husband will make the claim. Maybe her property she brought into the marriage, but her husband will claim in right of wife. The property on marriage has become effectively his through this legal principle of curvature. Um, so married women are embedded in here, but they appear as, as husbands. But if you're a widow, for example, uh, or an unmarried daughter, then you may well have claims, and there's no male to mediate them. But in particular for the elites, again because of this male control of property from, from generation to generation, very often the fathers establish trusts. And they appoint almost exclusively male trustees, and the male trustees then appear as the abnormalities. But in the underlying records, there often will be 